how can we understand identity philosophically and what role does it play in logic? Let's have a look. Hello everyone, welcome back to Attic Philosophy. This is a series of videos introducing the basic concepts of logic. In this video, we're going to be talking about identity in logic and how to use identity statements to express quantities, like there's at least two happy people watching this video right now. If you're finding this series of videos on logic useful, why not subscribe to the channel and get the updates? One really important application of identity in logic is that it allows us to count things, to say things like, to express sentences like, there's at least two happy people in the class, or there's no more than three rich people watching this video right now, or exactly two students got 100% in the test. Okay, we can't express things like that in first order logic without using identity. So let's see how we do it. OK, suppose we wanted to express that there's at least one F. OK, so like at least one happy person. Well, that's really simple. We just say there is an X and X is F. That guarantees that there's at least one of them. It doesn't say how many there are, but it tells us that there's at least one because an X exists. What about if we wanted to say there's at least two Fs? It's not quite so straightforward. You might think the obvious way to do it is to say there's an X, there's a Y and they're both Fs. But that won't guarantee that there's at least two of them, because the X and the Y could be the same thing. Now, this is a point that frequently confuses people about the quantifiers. When you have two quantifiers, there is an X, there is a Y. The X and the Y might be picking out different things, but they don't have to. So I want to just hit pause at this point and give you an analogy for how the quantifiers work that I think might be helpful. So suppose you've got this big urn of like little plastic coloured balls, what we're going to do is we're going to take a ball out of the urn, we're going to look at it, and we're going to put it back in again. And that's the important part. The ball goes back in again. Think about quantifiers like that. Each one says, take a pick from the urn, look at the ball, put it back again. So if we're saying there is an X, there is a Y, that means take one ball out, look at it, put it back, and then take a ball out, look at it, put it back. So do it twice. So suppose we had a sentence like, there is an X, there is a Y, X is a yellow ball, Y is a yellow ball. What would we do? Well, we could take a ball out, look at it. Oh, it's yellow. Mm, interesting. Put it back in. And then we do it again. We take a ball out. Oh, it's yellow. Interesting. Put it back in. Does it follow that there's two or more yellow balls in that urn? No. I mean, there could just be one. It might have been that we picked out the yellow ball the first time and then we put it back and then we picked out the yellow ball the second time we picked out the same ball twice. OK, so just because we pick out a yellow ball and a yellow ball doesn't mean there's at least two yellow balls. And exactly the same thing applies to the quantifiers. Just because we say there is an X that's F and there is a Y that's F doesn't mean that there's at least two Fs. There might just be one. So the sentence that we need to express that there's at least two Fs is this one. There's an X, there's a Y, X is F and Y is F, and they're not the same thing. So if we wanted to say there's at least two red balls in this urn, we could say pick out a ball, put it back, pick out a ball and put it back. If they're both red and they're not the same, then there must be at least two red balls. So in order to express that there are at least two of something, we need to use identity. We need to say the two things we pick are not the same. The X and the Y that we're quantifying over, they exist and they're not the same thing. They are two things and they're both F. OK, what about if there are three things? How would we say that there's at least three Fs? Well, we use the same pattern here and we just complicate it a bit more. There's an X, there's a Y, there's a Z. X is F, Y is F and Z is F. And none of them are identical to any of the others. In other words, X isn't Y, X isn't Z and Y isn't Z. If you think about it, that also covers the cases in which Y is an X and Z is an X and so on. So that's how we say there is at least N one, two, three, four, whatever of something. And notice a pattern there. If we're going to say there's at least one of something, we use one quantifier. At least two of some things, we use two quantifiers. At least three of something, we use three quantifiers and so on. 
Okay, so that's the tip to help you remember how many quantifiers you need to express. There's at least n f's. Okay, so that's how we say there's at least something. What about saying there's at most something? So there are at most two rich people watching this video right now. How would we say something like that? It's not quite so straightforward, but let's go back to our urn analogy. How do we say that there's at most one yellow ball here? Suppose you were to take a ball out, look at it, oh, it's yellow, and you put it back in, and then you do the same thing again. You take a ball out, you look at it, and it's yellow. Well, if there's only one yellow ball in there, then the ball that you picked out on each occasion must have been the same ball. So we can capture this idea that there's just one in there by saying, if you pick a yellow one twice, you must have picked the same ball. So in other words, for all x and y's, for all things you pick, if x is f and y is f, then they're the same thing. If you pick a yellow ball and then you pick a yellow ball, you picked the same ball twice. A bad way, but maybe a helpful way of saying this would be if you pick two yellow balls, then they were the same. It's kind of a bad way because they weren't ever two balls, they were always one ball, but I think it's a helpful way of remembering this kind of sentence. So that's how we would say there's at most one F. What about there's at most two Fs? Well, exactly the same pattern. We just get it a bit more complicated. So if you make three selections from the urn and they all come out as yellow balls, then you must have picked the same ball twice, okay? But there's different ways you could have done that. The first and the second could have been the same. The first and the third could have been the same ball or the second and the third could have been the same ball, okay? So there's three different ways in which you can pick the same ball twice by making three selections. And if we wanted to say there's at most three Fs, like at most three yellow balls in the urn, same deal again, just more complicated. If you make four selections from the urn and they all come out as yellow balls, then you must have picked the same ball twice. And there's loads of different ways you could have done that. It could have been X and Y that were the same, X and Z that were the same, X and W that were the same, Y and Z, Y and W, Z and W. If you think about it, that covers all the cases. So that's the pattern that we would use for saying there's at most one or two or three of something. And the thing to remember here is for saying there's at most one, we need two quantifiers. For at most two, we need three quantifiers. And at most three, we need four quantifiers and so on. So that can get a bit complicated. The payoff is if we want to say that there is exactly one of something or exactly two of something or exactly three of something, we just put together the stuff that we've just learned. So to say that there's exactly three yellow balls in the urn, we'd say, well, there's at least three and there's at most three. Because if there's at least three and at most three, then there's got to be exactly three. And often we can simplify our way of saying that. So let's just look at how we would say it by saying both of these and then let's see how we can simplify those sentences. Okay, so here I've written out exactly two Fs, and I've done it by saying there's at least two Fs, so there's an X and a Y, and they're both Fs, and they're not identical, and there's at most two Fs. So if you choose three times and it all comes out as an F, then you pick the same thing twice. We can actually shorten down what we've said there, because here we're talking about the two things that are Fs, and here we're saying if any things are Fs. But We've already talked about two of them, so actually we don't need these three quantifiers. We can simplify the sentence down to this. Here we're saying that there's two Fs, and here we're saying anything that's F is one of the two that we've already picked. Okay, so just think about that. There's definitely two things that are F, and anything that's F is one of those two things. So we've just simplified this down. Rather than introducing three new quantifiers here, we're just introducing one extra one. In the case of exactly one F, there's a further way that we can simplify things. So rather than saying there is an F and anything that's F is that thing, we can say this sentence. Okay, so we're expressing this using the biconditional. And it says, there is this thing X such that everything is F if and only if it's the first thing that we picked, okay, the X. That sounds a little bit confusing, and I think this one is. It's kind of difficult to understand what this thing means just by looking at it, but what it means is there's exactly one F. Now, it's not obvious why this sentence really does mean there's exactly one F, so let's just spend a little bit of time thinking it through. If it's going to say that there's exactly one F, it's got to be equivalent to this one. So a biconditional works both ways, left to right and right to left. 
So let's just think through each direction one at a time to see what this sentence is saying. Let's go left to right. It's saying there is this thing and any F is identical to it. OK, so they can't be two Fs because they can't be two identical things. There is this thing and any F is it. So there's at most one of them. But it doesn't tell us that there's at least one F because we haven't said that this thing's F. For that, we need the other direction. Now, this says that there is this thing such that anything identical to it is F. But of course, there's only one thing that's identical to the thing that we start with, namely that thing itself. So this is a very convoluted way of saying that the thing that we picked to begin with is F. So going this way, it says there's at least one F. That way was at most one F. Putting it all together, there's exactly one F. We're going to see this formulation quite a bit. This pattern only works for exactly one F. So we can't express exactly two or exactly three using this. It's just for exactly one. OK, so there we have identity in first order logic. We've seen how to include it in the language. We've seen how to give semantics for and we've seen how to use it to express quantities or numbers. OK, guys, that is all for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you've subscribed to the channel already, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If you're enjoying these videos, but you've got questions, leave me a comment down below. OK, I'll see you next time.